They didn't have their dress uniforms. Along that way were seven assassins of the black hand. And pistol, I mentioned cyanide and a crude hand grenade. Yeah. Oh, so we had, what is it called when you not only call it the reserves, but essentially the military takes over? Yeah, this mobilization. And when countries mobilize, it's not just calling out the army. What are they going to do? Yeah, they're going to attack. Mobilization. Nobody realized what that really meant. And the second assassin, which I'm sorry, I don't have trouble with the, with the Bosnian names, but he threw a bomb. It hit the back of that's the Archduke's car. Because the driver saw the saw the basically like a hand grenade, smoking hand grenade. Hit the gas, hit the back, bounced under the car behind it, wounding two officers. Then they quickly sped through town. The other assassins either didn't get a shot or panicked. They all started running, trying to cross the river, which was only about knee deep. Most of them would be caught right away. When they tried to commit suicide by biting into the glass cyanide, the cyanide was so degraded that it just made them sick. Princey is right here. He did not run. He crossed the street, crossed the street, and walked into Schiller's Delicatessen. Bought a sandwich. Tried to act like nothing's bad. You know, oh, well, there was a bomb. That's weird. And so that's what he did. Well, they said the Archduke would not just leave them. He wanted to go to the hospital and visit two of his officers. And so the plan was to change the route and just go straight through. But the lead driver didn't know about the plan change. And so he made the turn, and the Archduke's car followed. When they realized it, they slammed on the brakes right in front of Schiller's delicatessen. Princey was literally just walking out the door, and there he was. <laughs> he pulled out his revolver and fired twice, mortally wounding the Archduke and his wife. So the heir to the Austrian throne was assassinated. And I know you want to see a graphic version of the Archduke as a mustache. See? And there he bang. One more time. <laughs> Bomb. <laughs> That's the assassination. Doesn't that make perfect sense now? Yes. Here is a drawing of it. And Right here, that's Princey. Literally seconds after he assassinated him, he was too young. He was 18, and they're, cap they're too young for capital punishment. So they did not execute him like they executed everybody else. And they held him, and they're going to have a big short trial after the war. He ironically died just a few months before the war ended of his tuberculosis. And so Princey, this assassination, and by the way, the Kaiser... Franz Joseph overjoyed. He didn't like his nephew. Got rid of him. Got his next nephew, Carl, would be the emperor. And now it gave them an opportunity to get rid of Serbia. And one thing that happened right after it, right after this assassination, Austria did exactly what the Black Hand wanted. Horrific reprisals against Slavs. They executed Hundreds of men, random men, were executed, sometimes ripped apart by mobs in anger against Serbia. Because on those guys they captured who tried to commit suicide, they found papers connecting them directly to the Serbian secret police. They had them. Serbia is connected. And this is a. <coughs> this, they're, hang, they're being hanged. They executed the Yeah, they just found random slobs. I mean, these rounded people up and started executing men. This little execution machine where they clip, basically you flip a trigger and the rope would pull up about two inches and slowly strangle them. A horrific, kind of like garroting, remember that? And here, just hanging. They just killed all these people. Which, by the way, that's what the Black Hand wanted, in a way. The Black Hand wanted them to treat the Slavs badly. So that they can a reason to revolt. It's amazing how many times you get an attack like this or a terrorist attack, and the country that's attacked will do exactly 
but the attacker wanted it. Exactly. They just start lashing out. It's amazing how often that happens, including it's happened here. And so, with that, we get to the July crisis. And the July crisis is the run of the war. And don't think of it in terms of this long, like step by step during the month of worry about the assassination and so on. It wasn't like that at all. What happened was, at first, almost every country in Europe, including Russia, blamed Serbia and were mad at Serbia. And if Austria would have done something to punish Serbia, punishment, it's like a small little attack. I know. It would have killed people, but it would have been a lot different than full scale. But <coughs> everybody's mad at Serbia. This brutal, um, um, very harsh monarchy that had murdered at least two of their own kings. I told, didn't I tell you about one? No. One king, they defenestrated him. Oh, that's You know what defenestration is? It also started 30 years war. That's throwing somebody out a window. Onto an iron fence. <laughs> yeah, the Thirty Years' War was started that way. It's called defenestration. Well, well, what happened was though, everybody's mad at Austria. Even their allies are backing away. Oh, Austria, sorry. Everyone's mad at Serbia, and even Serbia's allies are backing away. Is that better? But Austria did not attack. They waited. And so you can imagine how tensions are high and the worry this might escalate to war. There'd already been two Balkan wars I mentioned yesterday, 1912 and 1913. They didn't go to war. Here, maybe, maybe we dodged a bullet. After, two weeks after the assassination, at least in public, most people were breathing easy. We solved the crisis. We might not be going to full-scale war. I mean, really, everything's fine. But nobody knew what was going on in Vienna. For that matter, Berlin. Vienna is the capital of Austria. And in Vienna, Austria is thinking we could take Serbia out completely. Take them out. Punish Serbia as an invade. Take them. Knock Serbia out. If Serbia is a problem and they're trying to get a revolt going, what's the best way to stop that revolt? And Serbia as a threat. So either totally destroy them, maybe even take parts of the country. Or perhaps even annex them. I mean, they were thinking all, all this way. That's why we got our chance. But the problem is, if they do a full-scale invasion, who might enter the war? So they need to make sure that their back is covered. And that is when Austria went to whom? Cover our back. And the political leaders, so this is civilian leaders and the Kaiser, responded with, yeah, get them. That will make you stronger. And they gave what history is called the blank check. Literally, they told Austria, do what you need, honey, Serbia, we got your back. So the blank check, do what you want. And the thing about this was, the civilian leaders in Germany were so confident that everything would be fine, right, they left the country or went on vacation. Late July, August, hot, you know, that's when they go to the spas or the mountains. The Kaiser always took his yearly a yachting trip of the Norwegian fjords. They're gone. Everything's fine. In fact, this made kind of the whole world. Tensions are less. Everything's going to cost you no war. Okay, we dodged a bullet. Behind the scenes, though, not only do we have this, the German general staff, including Eric von Mulkey, the head of the German army, he is convincing the Austrians, go all out. All out. And if the Russians attack, good. He wants war now. Von Moltke, the head of the German army. Head of the great German general staff, as it was called. His uncle was a, the, a great hero, won the Franco Prussian War 40 years earlier. And there's Von Moltke right here. And there's the Kaiser. But he's pushing, pushing, pushing. Von Moltke is thinking Russia and France are going to get stronger every day. What better time to get to take care of them now? If we wait five years, what's going to happen? It's your son. Does this remind you of something? Exactly 
was the South was saying for secession when they dropped their water bottles. They realized that we drop water bottles. You know, remember the South was thinking, if we don't secede now, a Republican Party will form and it will be too late. This is the exact same thinking. So, you know, it was the Kaiser's incompetence, no doubt, but von Moltke was pushing and pushing and pushing. So Austria is like, Austria has a couple different plans, and they go to their plan, full-scale invasion. Full-scale. They're going. And the thing is, nobody outside of Vienna and Berlin in just a few places knew what was going on. And then literally, the last week of July, it seemed like the whole world exploded. The July crisis erupted with nearly out of the blue, totally unexpected. Austria sent a 10-part ultimatum to Serbia, basically saying, you agree to these 10 parts or it's war. And these 10, or these 10 parts, each individual, um, each individual ultimate or each individual part said, each individual condition is actually what I meant to say, each individual condition was written in such a way that no way Serbia could agree to it. Basically, it would give up their independence. But, and to tell you how they planned this, they had 48 hours and they gave it to them Friday evening. Um, Friday evening, um, July 27th. What's happening? People are making home, it's the weekend. They wanted Serbia to turn it down, to not out of time. Austria wanted this as an excuse for war. Yeah. Yeah, they had to pay, it's called an indemnity. Yeah. Yeah. They have like they have that much money in the entire country. And but ironically, with Russia pushing them, Serbia kind of agreed to nine of them. They just put copies, part including we're not going to give that much money. Another one, the one they couldn't agree to was basically Austria would take over the police. Which means Serbia would become protectorate. They agreed to nine with caveats, but to Austria, no. And they, what did they do? This happened so fast. That week in the telegraph, telegraph lines and the brand new telephone lines were humming. <coughs> Austria declared war. I put declares like they're still doing it today. Declared war. But here's the deal. Once Austria declared war, and by the way, Belgrade, the capital of Serbia, is just across the Danube River from Austria. It's right there, so they started shelling the capital. Who said to Austria, I can't do that, pull back, and gave Austria an ultimatum. There's going to be a lot of Germany. Germany. No, Austria, or Russia. Russia gave Austria an, an ultimatum. But Russia, the Tsar's like, okay, wait a second. If we're going to give them an ultimatum, we got to show we mean business. So Russia began to, the Tsar gave the order to partially mobilize, which was, there's no such thing. You can't partially mobilize the military. Once you start the mobilization, it's mobilization. And so Russia began to get their military together. Now think about it now. Von Moltke's like, that's what I wanted. And Von Moltke goes to the Kaiser, who hurried back from the fjords, we should go on a fjord trip. In the winter. Even better. You get two or three hours to look at them. And then <laughs> Russia partially mobilized, and now von Volki went to the Kaiser and said, We have no choice. What must Germany do? Germany. Well, mobilize. But that means a bit. Germany mobilized, and once that happened, they sent an ultimatum to Belgium, right? Because if Germany mobilizes, who do they attack? France. Through? And that's how fast it hit. 28th of July, by the 1st of August, Germany is beginning getting ready to attack Belgium. And they also informed Luxembourg. Oh, we're going to come in. And Luxembourg is like, we're tiny. Yeah, okay. Yeah, poor Luxembourg is like, uh, here's the gate. Poor <laughs> Luxembourg. But that's kind of complicated. A lot of stuff happened. 
especially a few of you missing days. Let me try to clarify exactly what happened very briefly so you understand. So it all makes perfect sense to you. Serbian nationals killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, right? So naturally, Germany attacks France. Does that make sense now? Is it all I mean, just perfect sense? Yeah, well, this key thing. It kind of sums up the whole thing. Isn't this insanity? Yeah. <laughs> Think about this for a second. Insanity. There's a great book by Barbara Tucker, one of the great American historians, written in 1961 <laughs> called The Guns of August. And it's about the lead up to the war in the first month of World War I. It is a fantastic book. <laughs> well, John Kennedy had read the book, read that book in the summer of 1962. Really, really got to him. Kennedy was president. And that October, what would happen? The Cuban Missile Crisis, where we came within hours of blowing the world up. And Kennedy gave that book to all his cabinet <coughs> members and all his staff. He gave that as a gift. He said, read this. Read how Europe bumbled the war, and it looks like we might be bumbling to war. Where people are saying, we have no choice. We have to do it. We must do this. And it leads to armor, I guess. Of course, the 62, it would have led to future. I don't think we would have to worry about the AP exam. <laughs> I don't care where it we would have been roving the wastelands, uh, running away from cannibals. Okay, so moving on. Trust me, it's going to happen many other times. What? I was just going to say, in Austin, gosh, the air the Austin drove me assassinated. So eventually, freaking Austin. Well, on the right track, yeah. You, what? And so, here's a good cartoon. Serbia, all the way to France, and there's Britain. <laughs> and so on. Now, you want to see a newspaper headline from it? Oh, no. I love nations struggling to remember our allies. And the map is actually pretty good. You know, okay, obviously, this is all true. Area drunkard declares war in Ireland. And my personal favorite, it's hard to read, but the assassination of Archduke spreads fear at Archduke Convention. Okay, so, <laughs> the amazing thing is, it's pretty close to the truth. That's real headline. We're all at arms. That's where you know it's almost too good a satire. And it was almost... That's scary. That's a Pulitzer's paper. And so, worldwide war, yeah? And the U.S. is totally like... And here's the amazing thing. So many things that are going to affect American history, affect us this very day, are happening and we're going to maintain neutrality. And it's going to change everything that we're going to become. Our entire course of history are going to be decided whether the U.S. even entered it. It's absolutely remarkable. <laughs> Yeah, Italy said that Germany and Austria were aggressive power, so they don't have to come to their aid, and they'll stay neutral. And then declare war on them. And so, with that, uh, I thought I'd show you this one, now with the Russians here. This is British, so look at the two little yipping the Dachshund, you know, right here, for Germany. Here's the British, and there's a bulldog. I like that one. Yeah. Like the uh, let's not worry about that. <laughs> Maybe the details about the uniforms. But August 4th, you could argue, is a technical day that the World War One would begin. August 4th. And the reason why is this. The <laughs> reason why is this. So, Germany sent an ultimatum to Belgium. Belgium said they would fight. Belgium's going to fight with their top hats and all. But what did Britain then send an ultimatum, right? And that's where we get Germany attack Belgium. The UK sent an ultimatum to Germany. Don't invade Belgium. And Britain has already decided we cannot allow German domination of Europe and the Channel Coast. They've already decided we can't allow that. 
So they're going to make a decision. They don't have to go to war. But when they invaded Belgium, Britain enters the war because of Belgium. And like a flash, all these alliances ensnared them. And that is where it's soon going to make it. August 4th will make it the Great War. When World War II would begin, and what's actually really good after World War II began, it started going World War I. But this, this war became a worldwide war when Britain entered. The fleet could enter, they could attack all of each other. This reminds me like one of those giant puzzles where you have to put a piece in the entire three months. Yes, yeah. yeah. like, like the Dom, the world Dom. Yeah. Yeah. And after the war ended, it was pretty common to call this the war to end all wars. Because the assumption was nobody would be that insane again. <laughs> How? No, no. We've only just begun the 20th century. And this is a good cartoon. Crime of the Ages. Who did it? You see all the countries? Well, I'll get to that in a sec. And Italy's waiting, but knows the peace of Europe. And Every single country that entered this war, especially the great powers, felt that they were fighting a just and defensive war. They all believed that we were defending our national interests and we had no choice. And add one word to this, honor. They all thought our honor is at stake. We have no choice. Russia, for example, <coughs> their honor was at stake because they pledged to Serbia and France. Our honor is at stake. In fact, there's only one country you could say of the great powers that didn't have a choice. Great power. Great Britain. Had a choice. U.S. had a choice. France. France didn't have a choice. They were France. France. France had no choice. Every other great power in the world who entered the war had a choice. Everyone had a choice. It did not have to happen, but they made this choice. But Germany said it was a preventing war. For those reasons I told you about von Moltke. Russia and France are getting stronger, and someday they're going to attack us. We know it. <coughs> they're going to. So it's a preventive war just like the South and the Civil War. They saw it as, we know our enemies will attack us, so we have no choice but to defend ourselves now. Because in five years, we'll be squashed. By the way, how many people can tell the future? One. I mean, I'm right like 33 percent. I mean, tomorrow will be Thursday, and then the whole universe starts again. We all know that, right? <laughs> so, yeah, there's a belief that the universe started last Thursday. I don't know. So, every Thursday it starts again. Hey, prove me wrong. The best part about that is you can't prove it wrong. Yeah, no. But, same thing with. Think about preventative war. I mean, that's pretty scary. Couldn't you say anybody was going to attack you? Botswana's coming, people! We must attack! How dare they? Where's Botswana? Huh? Where's Botswana? Africa. Africa's really big. <laughs> Africa's really big. <laughs> Am I close? There you go. All right, yeah. That's Botswana today. Who's in that? And so with that, think about what this could be used in the future. We're going to do something, so we have to do it now. And since we can't predict the future, preventative war is equivalent to aggressive war. It's just an excuse to attack somebody. Or an excuse for a dictatorship. We have to mobilize our economy for war and take over because our enemy is coming. They're coming. Who's our enemy? Them, somebody, fascist, communist, terrorist, Canadians, somebody. Did you say it's through aggressive war? Yes, yeah, it's going to aggressive war. And this is done. We got to get involved in the civil war in Vietnam because if we don't, we'll be defending the shores of California from communist attack. That was used. They Korea was the same thing. Or what? They have weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass destruction was a preventative war. They're going to get them someday. We know what to do. They're going to use them. Iran is going to get them their weapons. We know it. And someday they're going to attack us. That's right now. That's right. North Korea is going to get a missile. We know they're going to attack us. We just 
we know it. So we must do something right now. Preventative war is scary. Because you can say pretty much anything and use it as a justification. And the big thing is, that's how authoritarian dictatorships of the 20th century are going to function. To get in a state of war, we have no choice but to take make this state into a police state or our enemies win. Yeah. Also, Jeremy is saying we're going to play defensive war by invading France. Yeah, because they're going to attack us. And so, the people of Europe are overjoyed. And every warring country is like, yes, we're off to the great adventure. Yay! In fact, they volunteered. They wanted to go find the assumption was here are French soldiers in Paris marching to the train station. And if you look carefully, some of them have flowers in their hair or fl and flowers in their uniforms. And they're kind of decorated as on to Berlin. It was just overjoyed. Here's French cavalry going through Paris. And they still weren't breastplates like in 1750. And that's French cavalry in 1914 with that machine guns and heavy artillery. Here are British millions volunteered in less than two weeks. In fact, so many young men volunteered in Britain for the army that it shut the economy down, split their factories and jobs. No one thought about it, the production tanked at a time when they needed to produce more. They had to pull guys out of the army. Here in Russia, St. Petersburg, overjoyed for war. People are volunteering, wanting to go fight. Get there before the fun ends. Right? Here's Germany, and I love these pictures. Marching off the war, you see flowers in the hair, and I like this one. It looks like the mom is decorating with flowers on his helmet. I mean, it's just this glorious time. Off to war. This one shows shows yeah. Oh, I, I thought I got rid of that picture. I thought I moved it. We get to see this one again, and this is on to Berlin. I like how they're packed in boxcars to get to the frontier. But this one is amazing. All those young conscripted, or young men, right before they're conscripted, remember 19, so they call them up twice a year for the year-long service. I told you about this yesterday. Yeah. Well, all these guys volunteer before the time came up, right when the war began. Almost a million men. And they would be fodder for the machine guns by October. And then they just have to keep calling up more and more. Overjoyed. Look at them. We might miss it. We might miss the fun. Including this wonderful okay. celebration in front of the Opera House in Munich. As almost a million people came out. And this euphoria, all these men joined up. Including this guy who escaped Austria a couple years earlier. Probably to avoid the Austrian peace crime draft. Isn't that kind of ironic? Yes. Right there is Adolf Hitler. The National Socialists found him. They knew, because that was part of his appeal after the war, National Socialist Nazis. They knew him being a veteran was part of his political appeal after the war, so they found that picture. And he joined up, he joined the Bavarian army, which fought under the imperial flag. He would fight in Belgium. He would be wounded. In fact, the war would end. He had been gassed. And uh, he was blinded by mustard gas. He was awarded the Iron Cross for bravery twice. He was a war hero, which you can imagine really added to his appeal after the war. He, the second Iron Cross was recommended to him by a lieutenant who just happened to be Jewish. Isn't that ironic? And here's Hitler during the war. I'll just show you one picture because it kind of fits in. That's 1915. Hitler ran messages. So that means he had to go really dangerous. He had to leave the trenches and go. That's really dangerous. And to run messages, and that's why he was awarded, he had to be a master of disguise. And so <laughs> it kind of doesn't look like he, where is it? That's it. And everywhere Hitler went, there was an X over his head. They should realize that's a bad omen. Somebody put an X over it, then they took a picture of that, and that's kind of what we're stuck with. He, like hundreds of thousands of other soldiers, um, would shave their mustache, shoot out a little mustache. Why? During the war? Gas mask. Yeah, so the gas mask fit tight. And then after the war, it became a symbol of that he was a veteran. So the reason he had that mustache was a political symbol. Just, I'm a veteran. I have this mustache. That means I'm a veteran. That's how we wore our mustaches, because of gas masks. And that mustache was really popular in Germany until like 1945. 
But with Nazi parties growing up in strength all over, I guess it's kind of coming back. I guess we made the complete circle. Oh, yeah. Nazi or fascist like groups. I can see the, the riot, or the, uh, the white supremacy riot, um, protest, protest, I guess, in Charlottesville. A bunch of them have. My guess is they probably weren't carrying gas masks. So, with that, the Schlieffel plan went off. They started going through Belgium. A Belgium fought. <laughs> they did. Their army, they still wore blue uniforms, they had some issues, but they fought. But along the Meuse River, they built these massive fortifications with 10 foot cement walls. They thought they could withstand any artillery. And they vowed to fight. And remember, Germany's on a timetable. If they get bogged down here on this wide river called the Meuse, here come the Russians. Here come the Russians. They thought the Russians would take about four to six weeks to fully mobilize. And the, so here's uh, pictures of the Belgium army. And I did this because they became infamous for their war dogs. The wars would pull the, the wars. <laughs> the dogs would pull machine guns. Yeah, so here they are, and supplies. Those are actually British soldiers landing in Antwerp using Belgium war dogs. Yes, and there's a little I love the I love the top ads. Well, one Liège and other places were fortified. And see all these stars? That was a hill with a fort on top. And Germany had to take each one of those forts, or at least get into the ring of forts, or the guns there could hit any German supply line. And so this is a big deal. And the reason I'm mentioning Liège is because it shows you how technology has changed, how war has become so horrifically deadly. Germany had a secret weapon. They borrowed an Austrian 350 millimeter howitzer, but they themselves had a 420 millimeter howitzer that they called Big Bertha. 420 millimeters, how big is that? 16 inches. It fired a shell the size of a car with high explosives. Howitzer means it lobs the shell. So it could come down on the roof of these forts. Here's some, uh, one of the forts in Liège. The forts are all there. They're still there. Some destroyed, some they had to abandon. But it just pounded these walls. And it didn't, it didn't so much as destroy them, but can you imagine being a Belgian soldier huddled in your shelter as these big shells are exploding over your head? I'm getting out of there. They were literally driven inside. And they surrendered. Modern war is significantly more deadly and more awful than anyone could imagine. Think yeah, about it for a second. Though. What would a shell like that do to a human? <laughs> you would not believe how many unknown soldiers they might be. Over a million. No idea. Either they disappeared or all they found were body. Just me. Yeah. Didn't much guns become the standard guns on the next battleship? Eventually, the World War II. Yeah. And the manufacturer was crop manufacturing. Adolf Krupp was the head, and his daughter was named Bertha. So they named the gun after her. Oh, I just kind of feel sorry for poor Bertha. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're now Big Bertha for the rest of your life. Somebody gave me a Frisbee a few years ago, and. Uh, they put Big Bertha on it, but I threw, the Frisbee was really cheap in a book. But Big Bertha survived, so that's why Big Bertha's there. And so, with that, Belgium now is going to be occupied. And here's the thing about Belgium. German soldiers are going to march through. They don't want to worry about their rear. Most of Belgium and the big hunk of France. In fact, if you look at this map, I'm just going to put my finger. See where my finger is? My little finger of Belgium? That's all that Belgium held for the next four years. That's all. They stayed in the fight. They did not quit. But <coughs> how Germany held them was through terror and reprisals. Terror and reprisals. A couple months, or I'm sorry, at the end of August, German reinforcements were going through the little town called Dana. And what happened was, as they were going through, somebody took a pot shot at them. Belgian militia had their weapons at home. And so one of them probably just took a shot. And the German soldiers are all worked up thinking there might be guerrillas everywhere. So the commander ordered them to, to, to grab anybody they could find. 
and they rounded up over 100 people. Numbers vary, but it was over 100 men, women, and children, and shot them all dead as a reprisal for that attack, saying, you attack, and this is what they do. Soon, they would begin to put lists of names for reprisals. Just a list of names. And if they say there's any attack on anything German, the first 10 names, we line them up and shoot. And you can imagine what they did to Belgium itself for the next four years. They stripped, of, stripped it of everything. Food, resources, they sucked it all in. So the civilians in Belgium and the parts of occupied France were literally on starvation rations. And then they took slave laborers and brought them back to Germany. But this was also part of the terror. They took teenagers, so your age, and brought 13 to 18 and brought them back to Germany. Not only to work, but what else does it do back in Belgium? There's no workers. There's true, no workers in my but there's also hostages. If we do anything in Belgium, they shoot them in Germany. We never see our kids again. After World War II, especially, Germany is going to be, well, I jumped the gun. So, Germany had pretty tough, um, this is actually them through, this is war footage of German soldiers going through Belgium. That's a pretty good shot. <laughs> the helmets were mostly ornamental. They didn't do much good. Now, look at the cavalry. Did you see that? They still have lances. That they're going to charge them down like that. They still use them, both sides. And they kept, for the whole war, they kept their cavalry like, waiting. we can get a breakthrough, we'll charge our horses through. Horses don't like machine guns. <laughs> Western propaganda would get a hold of this and immediately dump this poor little Belgium. And they would talk about how horrible it Germany mistreated Belgium. And for the, the entire war, this was an incredibly effective propaganda. As they exaggerated, here are slaves going back. That's a, their vision of something like what happened to not for reprisals. This is Britain, Britain, you remember Belgium, go join. This is America from 1918, and everybody knows that it's stopping the German, and you see what it is? It's just guessing what's gonna happen. You can use your imagination. Everybody knows that means Belgium. <coughs> Belgium was such an effective tool that after the war, Germans tried to say we weren't that bad, and we hated the fact that the propaganda said this about us. And then especially after World War II, they would say, okay, the Nazis were bad. We know that, but we weren't as bad in World War I. That's not all Germans. And that would become ingrained in German mythology. No, they were actually really bad in World War I. Okay, World War II, unbelievable. But World War I was bad too. And they don't like to admit that. You get a lot from World War II. It was the Nazis, not us. Now you might say, what? Germans. Slavery was the South, not us. You get the kind of, it happens other places too. It, Different degrees, but yeah. So, as the Germans advanced this way, actually the British sent about 100,000 troops, basically everybody they had, and they just were swallowed up and they began to retreat. And the funny thing about the British, they were going to march, and they decided, yeah, we're going to go to the Mediterranean. The British were ready to go home. They fought one battle and said, ah, sorry, France, goodbye. But then the Russians came in. Two weeks before anybody ever thought. Two weeks. And the Russians attacked with over a million soldiers. Here, a big wave, two massive attacks here and in Austria. Much faster. In fact, totally panicked the Germans. They could see Russian uh, cavalry going through Berlin. They actually sent 100,000 men from their right book and tried to send them back frantically to stop them. They didn't make it in time for Maybe one of the most important, I think it might be the most important battle of the 20th century through today. I really do think it's that important. The Battle of Tannenberg. And think about it for a second. America's not it. And this is going to affect so much. The Russians were attacking into Prussia, these huge columns. The Germans were outnumbered five to one. But do you see the advantage they have? Two big columns. 
The Germans focused on the southern one. Outflanked them. The Russians panicked. Each Russian soldier only had five bullets. Each Russian howitzer or cannon had an average of only 12 shells. They could fire everything in a few minutes. They panicked, and over 100,000 Russian soldiers surrendered. 100,000 Russian soldiers surrendered. Tannenberg was one of the most decisive victories in world history. This would change everything. Russia was not knocked out of the war. But they, but to the German point of view, we got whipped. We can finish these sides off anytime we want. And this is going to change everything about their point of view. We got them. And then, one more big battle. After Tannenberg, the, uh, the Germans after World War, I, World War I would make this massive granite monument there. The monument itself was bigger than the school. And it had all these, for this big victory, you know, they wanted something to hold on to after the war. You know, the shots of Hitler being there in the 1930s. Anybody want to guess what the Soviets did when they got to it in 1945? Blew it into tiny, tiny pieces. Not even dust remained. With that, Soviets were thorough. But really quick what happened here. The French were going to loop around, or I'm sorry, the Germans were going to loop around Paris, but they didn't have enough men. The, the supply lines were too long. So instead of looping around Paris, they cut to the inside, exposing their flank, and the French counterattacked the Battle of the Marne. And they convinced the British general, General French, it really was, to stay in the fight. The British stayed in. And this battle was <laughs> over a million men fought in this battle. Nobody quit won on the battlefield. But, there's a last, I know the buzz about right in, but the last thing we gotta get. But, the Germans realized the Schlieffland plan had failed. Their plan had failed. And they pulled back to this green line where it is on that map, and what did they do? They dug in. They should have quit the war, right? I mean, they should have quit. We, we're not going to win. Our plan failed. It's going to be a long, awful war. But why did they stay in the war? Because they started it. All they have to do is Tannenberg. They won at Tannenberg, and that kept them in the war. By the way, what kept the British and French in the war? The war. We won there. That's why these are so important. I just a little bit of the finish point. We'll go there. Yeah. 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 By the way, do we get five ultimatums or six ultimatums? Are you beckoning me? Yeah. And I come to, I come running? Yeah. Okay, because I really thought registration, they're going to call everyone in and make them type because we missed registration on Friday. And so I thought we were going to have more time on Tuesday. And so what I did is I did multiple choices. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah. okay. As it turned out, we just had to print this slip. Like, yeah. just, uh, don't worry about it. You, you've gone into the randomizer. And so it's just going to randomly pick classes for you. Oh, you're about Monday, too. So you got to take this class too. And we're going to do it just for this class. And you're going to do this. This time, I, I, my desk was very organized. For me, especially. But then somebody went like this, screwing around. That somebody was me, of course. <laughs> Um, you get paid for this house. <laughs> so, you got paid. And, uh, yeah, I gave them a room on Monday. So. And, uh, 
Thank you. Yeah, that Friday really messed me up with schedule one. Yeah, and then missing and then two days missing. after it was awful. <laughs> and you guys had a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got you didn't get that either. So it's on like page three. It's the 1914 map, but I'll give you a couple days for that. Hey, we got presentations today. <laughs> I have almost a same amount of hair. I could could be going bald, but I don't know. I don't think so. All righty then. Do you like my friends? I didn't get it. Oh, yeah, I heard that. Hey, Delaney. Yeah. Everyone, 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 everyone. Do you I heard you, you did an announcement. Yeah. I heard it. I know it's you. That's fine. Okay. Why did you not mention my name? Well, I'm like. And, and hey, what about Mr. Partridge? Mr. Partridge loves art. I do love art. Therefore, take art. This is empty. And, and then you. It's not that cool. Go ahead, go. Go ahead. All right, so we got presentations. Before we get to that, I I've been saving this all day, and it's been hard to save this up. But. <laughs> I know some of you might have noticed we do have an alien forest flame shot. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> As I understand it, Emma made this for me, right? <laughs> <laughs> Emma found this at a specialty store called Albertson. <laughs> oh, <hi>. <laughs> this is so exciting, people. Let's see this up. Okay, when your time's out, I'm gonna fling an alien. Okay, they have to be right? Like the whole thing's so scary. It's the whole And the bad part is, you're not overstretched, people. Which is kind of the rule you should always use for aliens. This is gonna change lives. What's the direction of the world? It's going to be interesting. I feel like they're wearing a seatbelt right now, and I really don't know why. In the large room. Oh, my sticks! Yeah, I'm like, we have a Hit it the map, right where you like you want yes, to yeah. All right. Where's these aliens and Okay, this is actually Well, Mr. Larson has study hall. Go get him. Ah, study hall's not as fun. It's your defense against the But there's still gonna be people in there. Where the aliens gonna be a big part? Let's see. I want to see if it'll stick to the wall. All right. Nixon. 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 Oh. All right. So. So, when you get to five minutes, I'll fling Alien 1 at you. I was kind of worried about open this. This is going to be a collector's item. All right, so, you have a paper due. So, everyone take out your paper, make sure your name is on, you need a stapler. Hopefully, I still have staples left. Celia is the keeper of the stapler. I don't need it. Yes! I did not expect that. 
That's like a double benefit. Okay, so let me try one more. By the way, this would be a good one for an administrator to walk in right now as we watch the playing aliens at it. Yes! Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we do have some presentations to do. And for those of you who were not here last semester, what I'm going to do is I will also take notes during the presentation and I'll ask one or two or three questions from every presentation. And the questions will be like this. It would be, for example, what did Anne say, minute three, 30 seconds in? No, I'll just take a few basic facts. So you do have to jot down some big, some major information. Okay. I, well, <laughs> I don't know what it's like doing. Like, you know, it looks like a salamander. <laughs> Aren't they cool? I tried to How big were they? Yeah, I actually I caught one. And you what? Oh. Oh. You're so talented for words. Yes. Maria, you are going um, Friday. So today we have Morgan, Emma, Levi. Which Emma? I mean, just me. And Jared. Yeah, what the heck? Yeah, you hear little band All right. So who would like to go first? Who would like to lead the way, Emma? Move on to a different <laughs> <laughs> We're never going to run out of Emma. So, Morgan, Emma, Levi, or Ann, who wants to go first? Don't all jump up at once. You're overwhelming me. It's like a parade. <laughs> wow. Because Emma is so busy volunteering people. Emma. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, here's the best thing I just realized. That whole thing about me shooting the aliens, we filmed that.